The United States is a very secession-y place, with very secession-y people. The Revolutionary War was an act of secession, and before the Civil War, there were attempts at secession in New England and in the South. But what about today? Are there still secessionist movements east of the Mississippi? Of course there are. You'd be staring at a dead screen if there weren't any. So let's start in the South with good old Florida, the home of every crazy news headline and possibly the cryogenically frozen remains of Walt Disney. In 1982, the U.S. Border Patrol set up a roadblock inspection point on U.S. Route 1 in the Florida Keys, checking for narcotics and illegal immigrants. However, this roadblock was on the only route on or off the island by car, therefore hurting tourism. As a protest, both the mayor and the city council of Key West, Florida declared independence. Their thinking was, if the U.S. is going to set up a border patrol station inside the country, then we might as well be our own. The local residents, frequently referred to as Conches, led to this new nation being called the Conch Republic. The mayor, Dennis Wardlow, was proclaimed prime minister. As another act of protest, he broke a loaf of Cuban bread over the head of a man dressed in a Navy uniform. He then quickly surrendered and applied for $1 billion in aid for the Conch Republic. Since then, the Conch Republic has been a tourist attraction in the Florida Keys, where you can get special license plates and passports. Next, we move up to Georgia, where the Senate got a little busy in 2009. In 2009, the Georgia State Senate passed SR 632, which expressed conditions under which the state would either nullify federal laws or dissolve the union. It didn't specifically mention secession. Dissolving the union means the exact same thing. It said that it would dissolve their union with the United States if Congress, the president, and or the judiciary took steps that would establish martial law without state consent, require any kind of involuntary service, take any restrictive action involving freedom of speech or the practice of religion, or any kind of prohibition on the sale or ownership of firearms. Former state governor Roy Barnes used this legislation legislation in an attack ad in the state's 2010 gubernatorial election. But it's hard for industry to take us seriously when the legislature attempts to outlaw stem cell research, passes bills about microchips in the brain, and talks about seceding from the union. We can't bring jobs to Georgia with the rest of the country laughing at us. I'll make Georgia work. We then move up the coast to the home of Southern Secession, South Carolina. In 2010, a sales engineer named Tom Utley formed a group known as the Third Palmetto Republic. When the group was formed, Utley was accused of wanting to start a war along with allegations of racism. Utley responded by saying that the movement was peaceful and that we all know who won the war, but brute force and bloody combat doesn't prove ideas right or wrong. It simply subjugates those who disagree. He also argued that minorities would receive better representation at the state level than they do at the federal level. Unfortunately, I couldn't find much on this group's current activities or even if it still exists. If you visit the domain of their old website, palmettorepublic.org, you will find that it is no longer a functioning website, but it is a registered one, so who knows what's going on. Before we go north of the Ohio, we must cover a larger secessionist group called the League of the South. The group is centered in Killen, Alabama, and campaigns for the independence of all the states that were part of the Confederate States of America during the U.S. Civil War. It also has ties to Liga Nord, a separatist movement in northern Italy. The group espouses a socially conservative worldview and opposes Marxist ideas. They do not classify themselves as neo-confederates, but rather as southern nationalists. The Southern Poverty Law Center has listed this group as a hate group since the year 2000, citing its opposition to the LGBTQ lifestyle along with claims of racist statements from group members. The leadership of the League of the South claims that they are not racist, and that the Southern Poverty Law Center is a leftist group that labels every right-wing organization a hate group. There are some legitimate to this claim, especially when the organization didn't label the new Black Panther Party as a hate group until 2011, even after an incident of voter intimidation occurred in 2008 in Philadelphia. We finally move north of the Ohio and go all the way up to New England, where both New Hampshire and Vermont have secessionist movements. Both of these states sent representatives to the Hartford Convention during the War of 1812, and modern secessionist movements are still there. In New Hampshire, there are two organizations that have considered secession as political options. One is the New Hampshire Liberty Party, which seeks to advocate secession within the state. But the far more successful group is the Free State Project, or FSP. The FSP is a libertarian organization that is trying to impact the Electoral College by getting libertarians to move to one state. The idea is that there are plenty of libertarians in the U.S. to win the popular vote of a state, 
but they are just too spread out to do so. Secession is not the express goal of the organization, but they have said that they are willing to use the threat of secession in gaining more leverage in negotiations with the federal government. In Vermont, however, we have far more obvious secessionist movements. 2003 was a year of leftist secessionist movements. In that year, both the Cascadian National Party, which was covered in a previous video, and the Second Vermont Republic were founded to pursue political independence for their states, motivated by the U.S. invasions of Iraq. The Second Vermont Republic was formed by former Duke University economics professor and co-author of Downsizing the USA, Thomas Naylor. The Second Vermont Republic is a left-wing secessionist group who fears corporate power more than federal power. As it says in their manifesto, the US government has lost its moral authority because it is owned, operated, and controlled by corporate America. And this is tagged onto a fear of globalization. Thoughtful Vermonters opposed to the tyranny of the United States government, corporate America, and globalization believe that Vermont should once again become an independent republic. In 2010, a Time Magazine article referred to the Second Vermont Republic as one of top 10 aspiring nations. In 2007, the group came under fire when information from the Southern Poverty Law Center connected the group to the League of the South. Leaders of the Second Vermont Republic have asked the leaders of the League of the South to distance themselves from racist members in order for both movements to have more legitimacy. Next, we move west back across the Mississippi to cover two groups I overlooked in the previous video. In the Pacific North West, overlapping with the Cascadian independence movement, is the Northwest Front, a white nationalist movement that wants to create a homeland for the white race in North America. This homeland would consist of the states of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. The organization was founded by Harold Covington, a neo-Nazi activist and writer whose career has taken him to South Africa, Rhodesia, today called Zimbabwe, the United Kingdom, and back to the U.S., all along the way either joining white nationalist parties or helping found them. The website for the Northwest Front Front has a document on it titled Dear White America, where Covington talks about how great the past was and all the great things the white race has done. We're going to let you in on a secret. It shouldn't be a secret, but few people dare talk about it in today's politically correct world. White people created modern civilization and modern science. He believes in the inevitable and nearly imminent collapse of the United States, and wants the white race to be prepared. When the collapse occurs, the many races and vested interest groups that inhabit the North American continent will begin to rip and tear at whatever's left of the United States, like vultures on a carcass. Bluntly put, we need to make sure that the whites get their piece of the carcass. So there we move to a less scary sounding secessionist group. In 2007, a group of Native Americans, referred to as the Lakota Freedom Delegation, traveled to Washington, D.C. to deliver a statement asserting the independence of the Lakota people. This proposed nation would incorporate parts of the states of North and South Dakota, along with parts of Wyoming, Nebraska, and Montana. But the borders is defined by the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie. The group, led by 60s and 70s American Indian activist Russell Means, does not recognize the legitimacy of the tribal governments or presidents, or any of the governing bodies is recognized by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The U.S. is a place where these kind of movements are natural. After all, this country was born in rebellion. If you haven't seen my video about secessionist movements west of the Mississippi, then click here, or if you want to hear about the constitutional theory justifying secession, then click this annotation over here. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.